I don't believe someone's gonna pay me for anything unless I give them value first. Why can you still sell after giving away free content? The more I give, the more opportunity I have to sell. The more people I can bring in from the top of funnel with free content, the more opportunity I have to give them to go deeper with me. Are there already people selling things and making money in this topic? That's a general global like, okay, this could be valuable. I don't do a lot of public selling on social media or YouTube. I usually just sell to my email list. So it happens behind closed doors and it's very targeted. And th these are very warm leads. What if there was a way to turn your knowledge into $1,000 or more per month in just 30 minutes a day? What if there was a better way than YouTube ad revenue when it comes to earning money from your content? Well, in this episode of the Think Media Podcast, I'm super excited to be talking with Graham Cochran, who is a best-selling author. He's a YouTuber, business coach. But ultimately, he originally launched a project called The Recording Revolution, a YouTube channel that was all about helping people mix their audio and learn how to make radio ready songs. And uh, it not only blew up, but he was able to monetize it in ways that the average creator and entrepreneur doesn't know about. So buckle your seatbelt, because in this episode, we're going to be learning about how to package what you know into an online course, YouTube tactics, and getting into a lot of juicy content and so I'm super fired up, but Graham, welcome to the podcast. Hey, honored to be here, man. Love what you're doing and excited to talk shop. Yes. And so I want to start off with your story to give us a little bit of context. Today, you're a specialist. You wrote a book, How to Get Paid for What You Know, and all about turning your knowledge, passion, experience into an online income stream in your spare time. But what I love about you is similar to one of my passions, and that is that like you did the thing before you taught the thing. And you didn't just start like teaching online courses about online courses, but you had this whole era where you took what you knew about re uh, recording and uh, musicians and all that kind of stuff, built up a channel, built up courses, made a ton of mistakes. And then now you're an expert in all of that and you can help people scale even more by packaging what they know into something like an online course. But take us all the way back to where you were in 2009 and how this all started. Yeah, man, I um, it's funny that you have to even like qualify that because I feel like anybody can teach anybody how to make money online these days and that's how they make money online, which is what I do now, but I did do it in a hobby, a niche, which I think is encouraging. Just a side note that there's plenty of people that will say, you can only make money online if you're teaching people how to make money online. It's like absolutely false. Most of my students are making money online teaching something other than like how to learn French, how to walk your dog, how to like, you know, fix motorcycles, how to, you know, get rid of back pain. So anyway, it's a real thing. And I, I didn't know this world existed until, and I didn't even want to be an entrepreneur, to be honest. Like I didn't, I didn't, that wasn't a world I knew. My dad was an engineer. My mom was a school teacher. I just wanted to do music. Like that's what I wanted to do. I was like the worship leader at church kind of guy. I wanted to be a rock star. I wanted to make music videos and I was trying to make a record or get a record deal in college and that fell through and I got married young. So I had to get a real job and actually provide. And I kind of let the music dream die. So 2009, to your point, I moved with my wife to Florida. We're in Tampa, Florida now to help a buddy plan a church and um, got a job. We all just moved and got jobs and we had our first baby. Um, we bought our first house down here. I'm age 26. And then I lost a, a job, my second job in the same year, in the middle of the great recession. So we don't know anybody here except for the people we're planning a church with. And I'm like freaking out and I don't want to go back to a job I hate. I've been, I've already felt like my dream died years ago. And so I thought, well, you know what? I do have a freelance audio skill. I, I kind of did that for like a side hustle for years, mixing records for bands. I'm trained in that. I, I went to school for that. I, I love making records for myself. And um, I was like, maybe I can do that full time. You know, it was always side money, but maybe it's, this is my sign to go full time. And that's what got me into actually YouTube because I was like, you know what? I need leads. I need clients and I don't know anybody in town. So while I'm trying to network in town, why don't I just blog, uh, put up some videos on YouTube? I think I launched my channel in January, 2010. I was like, and maybe someone will see like what I'm doing in the studio. I'll do some tutorials and show, here's how I got a kick drum sound. Here's how I'd make the vocal sound like this. And maybe... I can somehow get leads. And that was what all I thought I was going to do was to get some leads for the freelance stuff. That's amazing. And today, the recording revolution is now not your main channel, although with 639,000 subscribers, 720 videos, what's also kind of wild is you have 
passed the brand on to other creators, other p- talent, which I think is a massive kind of a, it's, it's a mind expanding thought. Cause a lot of times when people think of YouTube, they do think it's limited to themselves. If all they're building is a personal brand, um, then perhaps that's true, but you have defied a lot of common myths that many people think before we get into kind of how you packaged free versus premium or paid content. What were some of the lessons you learned for the recording revolution YouTube channel to grow to over 600,000 subscribers? Yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things, right? I mean, I think part of it, I was a little lucky with the timing at that time in that niche or that industry in music production, everything was like a guarded dark secret. No one was sharing the how, how do you make records sound good? All the, all the big time producers weren't sharing. Um, you would be lucky if you got an interview with somebody um, like Chris Lord Algae or Dave Pensado or any of these guys that were mixing, you know, all the big bands and they maybe shared a secret. But anyone who's learned audio and figured it out, you know, it's just stuff you learn. I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish their skill, but it's like, I, I'm not them, but I know, I know how it all works. And so I was just trying to put out the content that would help my friends who were trying to figure this out as well. And so my friends was like my avatar. They're musicians. Um, they want to make a professional sounding recording. They're not an engineer. So they think like a creative brain, not a technical brain. They just want to make their music sound good. They don't need to be famous necessarily. They want to know what to buy, what not to buy. And, uh, and they just want the truth. And so I, that's what I had in mind when I made videos. And I think I grew quickly, I grew slowly at first. So I don't want to say I grew quickly, but you know, maybe 18 months in, I started to see some traction of posting every single week for like 18 months. At that point, I started to see some some traction because no one else was sharing the truth. They were talking around the subjects, um, or it was really light conceptual content. And I was cracking open the software. You know, we use a tool called Pro Tools, which is a lot like Photoshop, but for music. And I was like, hey, here's how you get this sound. Here's the tool. Here's the step. And you could literally go do it and get the results. And people are like, who's this guy sharing? Like, this is so helpful. And I was explaining complex things in a simple way. So I think it kind of helped in terms of, I was one of the first people to really start telling the truth about music production back then, at least on YouTube. Maybe people were blogging about it. Um, that helped. And it was also a convergence of the, just like with video, right? Gear costs came way down. And so there was more of like this hobbyist market that was coming up saying, oh, I can, I can get a recording studio for cheap. And so there was a high interest in doing music production at home at that time. And, and so it was a perfect time for me to get on and start teaching all this stuff and teach them what to buy. And it really just took off because I just kept telling the truth, speaking to real people. And I, and something that you've talked about before is getting really clear on who the avatar is that your channel is for. I had that dialed down so well that I think people either, either liked it or didn't like it. And that made it help, help me, help me grow it. I think. And that's some powerful insights. You know, I've heard it worded this way, moving the free line. And I think one of the big things that holds a lot of people back is they're afraid, especially if they aspire one day to create an online course, they're like afraid of giving away too much mm. or they get, in paralysis. Oh, like, should I share this or should I hold back? And I think holding back is a bad strategy. You know, Mm -hmm. it'd be like, should I hold back when loving my spouse? Like, I don't know. I just don't want to kind of love them fully. Should I hold back some for later? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Should I hold back when loving my friends? And maybe it's a a fixed pie thinking too. Like, Mm -hmm. of course there could be the idea of, You know, are you going to run out of everything you have to say? But if you continue to grow and if you realize something like this is so complex, there's, you know, uh, NAM just happened, the National Mm -hmm. Association of Music Merchants. I spoke there one year for, I think, sure. And that's in Anaheim. There is endless depth to home studio recording, studio monitor, software, questions people could ask. Um, Your top feud video as well is six years old, 3.7 million views, and it's how to build a home studio, Core Desire, for under $350, which is a radical headline because $350 is nothing for a home studio. So um, your second most viewed video, a million views, recording great vocals and two steps. So success leaves clues, and it's cool to see. And then I love that you said, you know, it still took 18 months. Everyone out here is trying to get viral videos and a gold play button in 18 days. Oh my gosh. And so just the patient patience and persistence of consistent content. And so you start building up this channel. You are very generous with your knowledge. You share real raw, gritty, 
authentic and practical deep tactics people can use. And thus your channel starts to grow. You start to build trust. You start to build a brand. At what point did you package what you know into an online course and what was like your first product that you launched? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, real quick to your point, giving, you can't give away too much. I don't, I don't, I don't believe in that ever. And, um, I've been told many times, like you give away too much content. And I think I'm like, I think you give too little away. I think the reason why I was able to grow is because I gave so much away. No one would care about me or know who I am if I didn't give so much away. So I've never seen giving away free content, cannibalize paid content. Just, and I've been doing this for 14 years and two brands. So it's just my experience. The more I give, the more opportunity I have to sell and people love it. And there's a lot more we could unpack there as sort of why you can still sell when you have free giving uh, content on the, on the platform. But uh, I, I experimented with selling content really quickly because I, I realized that you know, what I thought was a way to make money, which was, hey, I could uh, sell banner ads on my blog. You know, this is 2009. Hey, I could, you know, try to do some, I don't think the monetization option was available for me at the time on YouTube. It was so early. I just started posting, but I had some readership and I had an email list. And so I thought, you know, banner ads, some advertising, some partnerships with some brands, microphone companies, you know, speaker companies. And I made, you know, a few hundred bucks here or there. And then one day I was, planning on doing like a massive series on YouTube on this topic, teaching this software, Pro Tools. You know, back in the day, like I couldn't upload videos longer than 15 minutes. Um, and I was like, I'm going to need three to four hours to explain this software that's confusing people in a way that I want to explain it. And I was like, I could do that as a YouTube series. And don't get me wrong, I've done tons of YouTube series that were super long and, and bingeable, which is a lot of fun. But I was like, this one's going to be so long. Let me test something. Let me see if someone would actually buy content from me. So I filmed this four hour course. I didn't know it was called a course. I just filmed four hours of explaining this software, chopped it up into logical sections, put them in a zip file, got a PayPal button, used iWeb on my Mac, and then emailed my list and said, hey, I have this thing and I called it Pro Tools Bootcamp uh, and I sold it for 47 bucks. And I said, basically, it's this is the most popular software in the audio world. It's like, here's the best way to understand it without it being complicated. It's not gonna be boring. We're gonna make a real song together and you're gonna see how to use this as a musician. See if you wanna buy it. I didn't think anyone would buy it. And I remember the first sale I got, I was in Seattle. I know you're from that, that area. It was in, originally, I was in Seattle, um, my grandfather's funeral. Um, and it was after the funeral and I was back at the condo where my, my grandparents lived downtown. And I, I needed to go get some Wi-Fi because they didn't have internet in their, in their unit. This is 2010. Um, they're like, they don't, we don't have internet. So I went down to their cafe to get Wi-Fi just to check email. And I got like a PayPal's, you have money type email. I'm like, who's, who's, who's sending me money? You know, I didn't have a client. It's only 47 bucks. I'm like, that's such a random, oh, that's the course that I, I emailed up to my list. Some dude named Paul bought this zip file and, uh, and then he loved it. And then another person bought it and another person bought it. And I didn't make much money. It wasn't much of a launch. Like, you know, Amy Porterfield and Jeff Walker would have laughed at me, but I didn't know they existed. And I was like, huh, somebody paid me for digital copies of videos that I filmed. I've already filmed them now and I could now sell these videos forever. And that was like six months into this journey for me. So it was very early on. I didn't make much money, but that was when I understood digital products. And for I just had the vision all of a sudden of like, oh my gosh, what if I had more courses? What if I had uh, more of a bigger of an audience? What if I could sell these at higher price points and all of the above? And I just saw all these dials I could imagine, these imaginary dials I could start to turn up in this fantasy of a future. And I just got really excited about what was possible using YouTube to drive leads to my list to then offer them even more in-depth paid training. And that was way more exciting to me than ad revenue. Wow. And that is... Um powerful experience through telling your story, kind of starting with the 1.0 version, and now it has grown and recordingrevolution.com store, I'm sure has had multiple iterations, but I see three different digital products, total home recording, musical income, mixing university. So you've made multiple products and now you have multiple businesses as you've continued to scale. But I do want to take it back. Why can you still sell after giving away free content? You alluded to that earlier and you said you have some more content on that. Drop that on us. Yeah, this is this is like one of the best questions that people ask. They should ask this question if they're trying to sniff out this business model, right? Because people think, here, here's what I hear. People think they either think you, you do YouTube, which is it's all free and you just get this massive audience and then you make money off of brand deals or, or ad revenue or whatever. 
or you sell merch, or you have paid courses and, and you're thinking about funnels and digital marketing, and then you just have to drive ads to get people to buy your thing. They view them as two separate worlds or two separate games that are being played. And I, I posit to you that it's, it can be one and the same. Yes, you could do either. And I, I'm doing a hybrid. I'm building an audience on YouTube and, and the videos like, and this is why, and I send all my people to, to you and to Think Media to learn how to do video and, and even YouTube stuff because I know that when they watch your video, what's gonna happen? They're gonna get educated. They're gonna, they're gonna trust you. You're trustworthy. And I know you're trustworthy. I mean, I, I know you as a real person, but like I could watch a hundred of your videos and feel like I know you. And like, that's a powerful thing, right? So then now if you had something to sell to me, I, I already know who you are. I trust you, I already like you. It's so much easier to sell. So I see them as like these beautiful things that work together. So coming back to your question, in my book, I talk about this because this is one of the biggest questions. I don't think anybody would read the rest of the book if we didn't address this early on of like, okay, well, if I'm gonna be making free content and giving it away um, in something I call the value circle, I talk about in chapter two, then how am I gonna still sell the thing? I and mean, then people are very confused. And so I think... The content is your marketing engine. It's what gets you discovered. That's why YouTube is so powerful, right? It's a, it's a massive search engine. You can build authority and credibility. People can test drive you. They can go watch a video of yours and say, wow, I did what Graham said and it worked or I got the results. He must know what he's talking about. Never have to give me a dime. You can test drive my knowledge, test drive my thoughts or my experience. And if you like me and, and you wanna go deeper, then why would you buy something from me? Why would you buy a course on mixing if I just taught you how to mix on YouTube? Well, the reasons are, in my opinion, and maybe you have some more too, Sean, is like, I think one, an online course or a paid community, well, let's just say online course, you can go way more in depth in a course. It's just the, the, the vehicle, it allows for a deeper, deeper, deeper dive into certain things. In a 10 minute video, even a 20 minute video, even a 30 minute video on YouTube, I have to hit a bunch of things that can be valuable, but I can't go as in depth as I want to. And, and there's other videos I'd wanna put in a course that aren't gonna be clickable on YouTube. They're not gonna serve the algorithm. It's just, but it really, you need to know this. So you can go more in depth. It's curated information. The, the more people get on YouTube, and I, I welcome everybody get on the platform, there's room for everybody, but the more people, the more overwhelming it is because there's so much more videos, many more videos, and where there's overwhelmed, there's opportunity, right? So if you're overwhelmed, just take my course because it's step one through 20, or it's A to Z, it, everything you need to know in one place, just log in and you can just go linearly. I'll hold your hand through the process. People are paying for that curation. They're paying for proximity to you because inside my course, now you're a customer and now you can like in a Kajabi backend or Teachable or whatever you use, you can like leave a question under a video and I'm gonna answer your question because you're a customer. I can't answer every YouTube question. I mean, I guess I could, but I, I just don't have the time for that kind of thing. I wanna live my life. So you get the priority response to, from me because now you're in proximity to me as a customer. I can have more downloadables and other uh, you know assets that help you learn it. And you know, people pay attention when they pay. They People who pay, pay attention. And there's that psychological thing of they're gonna dive in because they paid for it, they're gonna get results. So all of those things come together and that's just with a course. If you have a community element to this thing, well then now you can get into my private community and now you can talk to my other customers who are going through courses, you can talk to me, you can add live coaching elements to it behind a paywall where you can really deep dive. So people I think are going from far away your free stuff to closer, maybe on your email list where now they're hearing from you regularly to really close if they buy a course of yours, ultimately to any kind of coaching relationship, they're paying for proximity to you. And I think we're in an age of people finding the teacher they like, finding the personality they like, and wanting to pay to not just have access, which sounds like this weird prostitutional thing, but like I will pay to get closer to an educator or a content creator who I really respect and I wanna learn more. And I want that person to actually know my name too, which is kind of, a cool, I wanna be in relationship a little bit. Um, and so you pay for proximity and that's the powerful thing of, the more people I can bring in from the top of funnel with free content, the more opportunity I have to give them to go deeper with me. And I've never seen it cannibalize. We've experienced the same thing. And those are some powerful insights. I'm sure the listener is dying to know though, you mentioned the value circle. And so in chapter two of your book, it's give, sell, over, deliver, receive. Just give us a little bit of a breakdown of what is the value circle and what are these four touch points what are some nuggets around them? Yeah, so if I explain my business on the back of a napkin, that's what I would draw. I draw this circle and the top of it says give and then to the right, sell, the bottom receive and then or over deliver. And then the fourth one is receive. And, and in the middle of the circle is the word value. So what drives a good business is not, is not really the widget 
or the course, it, it's the value that it, it imparts. And usually that value in our type of world comes in the form of transformation. People aren't buying information. They're not buying a course. They really want to buy transformation. I want to lose 20 pounds, or I want to be more productive, or I want to um, have a better marriage, you know? I want to, all these things that take, you know, these are transformations I want. In my case is I want to make my recordings go from sounding like crap to sounding professional and like proud of sharing it with my friends or putting it on Spotify. Or now I'm teaching people how to launch business. I want to go from a nine to five I hate to like having a flexible business that's six figures a year and 20 hours a week to run or whatever it would be. That's a transformation they're buying. And so I have to give them value at every point in the journey. So I don't believe someone's going to pay me for anything unless I give them value first. And so I like to lead with generosity. So that's why I'm big on content. I've outsourced and and automated and eliminated almost everything I can in my business except for valuable content every single week that's truly good. And I and I think about it like this piece of content might be the only video of mine or podcast of mine or whatever that they interact with. I want to make sure it's it's life changing, even if it's in just one percent life change, so that their interaction with my brand was really valuable and positive. If I do that well for free, that gives me the right to then sell them something or offer them something. It's maybe a better word. And then what I offer them better be valuable as well. Like I better have a product that's even better than my free stuff because of all the things we talked about and it gets people results. So you don't want to bait and switch them and sell them a piece of crap. You could, but you won't be in business for long once they find out. So you give value for free, you sell something valuable and they're like, wow, this is totally worth what I paid for it. And then you over deliver, you give more than they thought they were going to buy. You can do this in a lot of different ways. I'll sneak in like a mini video training on the welcome page of a course and they buy it. I'm like, hey, I didn't tell you about this, but I have an entire training on X that I want to just give you as a gift um, and, and blow their minds. I saw Brendan Bouchard do this years ago. He had this really powerful training after I bought a course of his. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is even better than the course. Like I didn't even know this was in here. It wasn't on the sales page, wasn't a bonus. It was an over deliver. And you can see companies do this all the time, big and small ways. Uh, even Sweetwater, right? You buy, I buy audio equipment from Sweetwater water and like my kids know sweet water not because they care about audio but because it, there's candy in the box when it comes there's like smarties and all these candy and that's that's not like a major thing but it's the little thing of like oh man they put someone put candy in the box and it just it's a beautiful experience so you give value you sell valuable stuff you over deliver with something valuable if you do those three the fourth part of the value circle is then you will receive value you're already going to receive money if you sold but you're going to receive testimonials. You're going to receive people sharing your brand. Like you've got to follow Sean. You've got to check out Think Media. This, this guy's awesome. This stuff is awesome. And then that gives you the opportunity, the, both the money and the testimonials give you the opportunity to keep giving away stuff for free, which is now you're back to the top of the circle and that allows you to sell. So you can see how they all kind of work together to stay in business. Um, and you, you don't want to go out of business. You just want to keep the circle spinning and spinning and spinning. So you need to sell so that you can give and you need to give so that you can sell and it all kind of circles around value. It's a beautiful framework. And so our community is listening to this and they've made the decision, okay, I've committed to YouTube and I'm getting views, I'm getting subscribers, or I'm just starting, but I'm also trying to build out my business plan and think down the road of what will I sell one day or what, which piece of my knowledge will I package? Or perhaps we have many people in our community that are still not, they're on the fence, not even because they're hesitating, because they're still in the planning stage. They have multiple topics they're thinking about. I want to start a channel about this or pivot my channel towards this. And we do emphasize a lot of clarity is power, reverse engineer first. Every battle is won before it's ever even fought. If you're going to go into business and you want to quit your corporate job or you know, go part-time or be able to do this full-time, it's smart to start with the end in mind. So what is step one is find your idea and you have a profitability framework. Sometimes people struggle with online course because it's maybe not positioned right. They make it, but the, it's crickets. It could be a marketing problem, but, but break down how to actually come up with a profitable online course for those who may have the misconception of, yeah, if I build it, they'll come, you know, what will people even want? And why would someone even want my online course? So, so what is the uh, profitability framework? Yeah. So this is the most important part. Um, cause what I'm teaching is like, not just how to have a, a big YouTube channel, right? That to me, it's a, a means to an end. Like it's a tool. Um, because what I'm teaching is how to build a business, which really helps you build the life you want. So it's a bit, it's important to understand the role of everything. So if you start with end in mind to your point, which is I, I want to make a sale, I want to sell something so I, I can have an income, then you have to 
like anything, you have to have something that the market values. And so part of what we talk about in that, in that chapter of the book is, you know, start selfishly, like just what, what do you love to talk about? What do you love to do? What are you good at? What are you passionate about? What have you had experience with? I don't like to use the word expert or expertise only because it paralyzes people. I don't, I never, I haven't felt like an expert. I, I, I didn't feel like an expert when I started the recording revolution. I knew a lot about recording. I was just sharing what I knew you know, that could help people. I didn't feel like an expert when I started a personal brand business coaching, but I had a lot of success, you know, selling stuff online and building a business and I could share what I, what's worked and what hasn't worked. So you get rid of the expertise language, but you maybe create a list of, you know, all the things that you could talk about on YouTube or could build a channel around that you would enjoy. And my, you know, my list would include football, Star Wars, pizza, you know, really nice hotels, you know, travel, um, you know, my faith, it would include, you know, family stuff, it would include personal finance and, and investing, like all the stuff I dork out over, just like whatever my, my library is in the books behind me, it's like, it would include all these different things. And it, you could make the case that any one of those could become a business. I mean, people are making money probably off of every single one of those niches, but you start with what you love and what you're good at. Then you have to then take that list and filter it through the lens of, is there an intersection where one of these or two of these or three of these line up with what people value and will pay for? Is there a market for this? And this is not as complex as it sounds, right? Like this is, are, gosh, are there already, you know, books being sold on this topic? If there's books being sold on Amazon, lots of them around the topic, then you know a major publisher has already put money into the market research to say, I'm going to print books and, and push this author because we think we can make money. They've done the research for you. If there's, you know, infinity groups on Facebook or YouTube, big YouTube channels around this subject, all of these things are good indicators that, you know, there's a market here. The more saturated, the better, I think because then you, it's proof that you can make money in this market. If it's hyper niche, we don't see anybody doing it. It could be either amazing because you're the first one and you're going to crush it, or it's a really bad idea because nobody really wants to, to buy a course on how to iron your ties, you know? Like there might be some niche, it's too small. So I, if to be safe, look for, are there already people selling things and making money in this topic? Um, that's a general global like, okay, this could be valuable. Uh, and then I, I really think what makes it even more important is drilling down to real people. What do real people say about this? Where are they getting stuck? What are their real dreams? Is there a gap in the market that you could come in and be more specific around? Um, and so what I want to get to is just like the concept of you're in YouTube land. So I think you've got people that, and you, I don't want to put words in your mouth, are already excited about YouTube, want to do YouTube, see the value in YouTube. I get a lot of people I'm having to convince to do YouTube because they want to jump to, I want to sell a course. I want to have a paid community. I want recurring revenue. I want passive income. And I'm like, okay, what are you going to sell? I think a course on this. Great. Do you know anyone's going to buy it or do you have anyone to sell it to? And they don't yet. And so I'm trying to convince them, why don't you build a YouTube channel first and start to create content and see if anybody cares. And, and not only do they, if they care, figure out what part of it do they care about? Like every video I put out is a test to see which which topic is really the hot button issue that I should probably pay, create some paid material around. And I don't know that I can guess, but it's really the interaction with my, my YouTube audience and then my email list if they go deeper to figure out, okay, what could I help you with more? What do you, if I could give you results in the next six months what, that you would want, what would they be? And if I could coach you one-on-one, -on -one, what, what would you want me to help you with? And if you start to see trends and patterns, then you get a better clue of, okay, in general, I help people make recording easier, but more specifically, what part of it do they want the most help with? And that's a better way to then go build a course because now you basically you're extrapolating from your YouTube data of what, what people like and just going deeper on that subject. Otherwise you're, you're guessing and it could be an educated guess, but I'm not that smart. So that's how I see those things working out is start with your passions and interests, see if there's a market for it, drill down what specifically do people want out of that. And, that, and that's not as as fast of a process as maybe we would like. You're very familiar with the YouTube world. And then of course, your core way you serve and help people today is you help people package what they know and turn it into a course and learn all the gritty details. Um, and, uh, and really, so you understand both. I'm just curious some stories from your community, people you've helped of some examples of online courses that maybe might be surprising to our listeners um, or that might be kind of interesting and that might help stretch our thinking into just what's possible and what kind of online courses people will actually pay for. Yeah, so this is fun, right? I have a student named Lane. Um, he was a pastor and he started a YouTube channel and a brand called Preaching Donkey. 
and he wanted to help pastors preach better sermons. And so he started with an ebook. He was writing ebooks, um, and he wasn't, you know, he maybe would sell like a thousand dollars worth in a month. And that's when he found me and was really kind of, it wasn't necessarily me, but figuring out maybe it shouldn't be a book. Maybe it should have like a course and some more paid things. And so he, he started to work on towards that end. So he built out his book idea into a course and then multiple courses and then a paid community. And then he got some one-on-one coaching from that. So he's gone from maybe $1,000 to $2,000 a month with an ebook, which, which was pretty consistent to doing $15,000 a month now consistently. He moved to the beach where he wanted to live in Florida and his wife stays home now and works with the company. And so it's him and his four kids and his wife living in in the panhandle of Florida, 15K a month. And he's working, you know, last time he emailed me a couple weeks ago, maybe 10 to 20 hours a week. Um, and And it's all started by helping pastors preach better sermons. I have a student named Aiko who teaches native Japanese speakers, helps them better pronounce their English. So think about like business executives, you know, um, actresses and actors who are trying to come into the English market and they already speak English. She's not teaching them how to speak, but they're trying to get rid of the accent a bit and pronounce English a little bit better. And so she was making a thousand to $3,000 a month, hit or miss doing some coaching. Now she's doing $30,000 a month. She's built out a framework. She has a funnel. She sells everything from a membership to a course to cohort coaching, but they find her through YouTube and then they go deeper with her. And she's got a tiny, it's a tiny micro niche, but she has, she charges really high prices because it's such a unique group of people who are like, I, you're the only person that does this. And I need this help in my business career or my acting career. Or she has a couple of athletes now that want to move to the States and play baseball. And so they want to speak better English or pronounce it better. So she's doing like 30 K a month. And then, uh, I've got, I got students that teach not just guitar, but ambient guitar, right? Like how to, like how to do ambient guitar well, which is a style of guitar playing with delay pedals and all this kind of stuff, which is to me, super niche as a guitar player. Like I, I'm like, how could you build a, a channel around that? But he's got a channel called ambient guitar Academy and he's built that into a six figure year business. And he works about 10 hours a week max. And now he's, he takes Fridays off. He's got his son and it's just, it's gone from fledgling. Like, can I do some videos to, a framework, a system to now take these leads from YouTube and build out consistent income. Wow, one of the things, these are stories are so inspiring, but one of the themes that I also love is is there's a lot of values alignment with our community because people want to maybe not just have freedom from the thing they're doing now, but family is a value, faith is a value. And no doubt about it, setting things up takes work. Building some things out takes work. And this all takes work. But to hear the stories of doing it 10 hours a week, 12 hours a week, being able to take Fridays off, once you have some of the automation pieces here, or especially, this is why we also love online courses at Think Media, is because building it is one thing, but once you've created it, you now can create it once, but sell it multiple times. And, uh, you know, we've updated our core YouTube course a few times. So there's, we circle the, as the globe spins around, we've probably rebuilt it about four times and certain industries also shift more like YouTube has updates and saying all that the dream is this lifestyle that it creates and the freedom that it creates. And so in just a second, I do want to, um, dive even deeper into the income engine and talk about these four focuses that you can focus, uh, in a business like this. And so, um, we'll get there in just a bit, but I do know that listeners may w- be at a place where they're ready to package what they know into an online course and they are looking for that step by step. And so I definitely wanted to let everybody know you've got a class. Um, we made it easy to get to at thinkincome1k.com. That's the number 1k.com. Of course, we'll link it up in the show notes. This is all, all about how to generate your first $1,000 a month of passive income in just 30 minutes a day and learning the four steps to create a dependable online income. You're going to get a lot more nuance and detail there. So check that out in the show notes. And we'll, of course, also link up so much I want to talk about in the pages of Graham's book, How to Get Paid for What You Know. Um, But that's, of course, available on Amazon as well. And so that will be linked up in the show notes. Talk about now the income engine. So there's so many pieces. How do you build it? How do you structure it? How do you do that? And, and people can follow you and, and learn all of that. 
But the course is done now. So what is the income engine and what are these uh, these four steps? Yeah, so one of the questions I get is, okay, Graham, I built a business and I built the course and I maybe I launched it and it's out. What next? What do I do every day? That's like the question I get. So what do you do? It's a funny question, um, but it, if you get to that point, that's a huge accomplishment for one to like have launched your business, actually put a, a product out there in the world. And even if you made a hundred bucks, like you did it. Now what? And so there, the way I looked at it, I was trying to answering this question over the years, I realized, man, there's four things that I'm still doing every week in my business. And so that, that's what I call the income engine. How do you keep this thing spinning and have the better chance for things to grow, right? Because I think momentum theory is a real thing that given enough time, if you're delivering value and you're consistent enough time, you will gain momentum. A video will pop, you know, something will happen. You can't control some of those things, but what do you do in the meantime? And so it's really simple. The system that I teach is, is like really basic, but it's like you need a lead generation machine. And so I believe in content marketing, meaning I don't run paid ads and I, I never have. So I'm not spending money on marketing. It's all free, but it's my time, right? But I really believe in the power of content marketing. So if you've ever thought you have to do paid ads, I, I'm a good test case. I've done two seven figure businesses and I didn't run paid ads for either of them. So it's possible, I'm not saying you can't, but you don't have to, but you need leads. And so I'm teaching content marketing. So that means every week I'm creating new content. And it, to me, it, it's at least one piece of content a week, one main YouTube video. We could split that up into some reels and some other short form content or chop it up one main video podcast or something like that per week. So the more content you put out, you never give up doing that because that feeds the, the engine and that's how you got started in the first place. Uh, the second piece of the engine is um, growing your email list. So I, as much as I love YouTube, and I don't think it's going anywhere, and I think you probably agree, um, I, I want to get people off of YouTube onto my list, right? Because I own the list. If I, if I just build up a big Instagram following or a big TikTok following, and then Instagram gets, no one cares about it, and TikTok gets banned from the US government, and then YouTube shuts down, you know, then I have no access to the audience I've worked hard to build. So I want to make sure that it's not just on YouTube, but I want to invite my super fans like, hey, come deeper with me. And that's a big part of what I teach in the book is like how to create lead magnets that get people to want to leave YouTube and join your list. And why would they want to? And what does that look like? But the list is important because that's who I'm ultimately selling to. I don't do a lot of public selling on social media or YouTube. I usually just sell to my email list. So it happens behind closed doors and it's very targeted. And th these are very warm leads and they can convert better um, for me. So I always want to be list building always. And I'll do that even like even in my book. If you read my book right at the back of the book, there's a giant opt like lead magnet. Hey, do you want this entire mini video course, 30 day training, go to grahamcocker.com slash whatever. Like there's a lead magnet in the book because I don't have their email address. Even if they read my book, I want them on my list. So I'm always list building. Number three is real quick. I'm always nurturing that list. You don't just build a list and just sell to them. You know, they, they're still your people. You're still, you're there. You're still leading them and teaching them. So most of the emails I send are just valuable free content. Going back to the value circle, I'm, I'm teaching them new stuff. I'm sending them to my latest YouTube video. I'm like, I notice something in the news that's interesting and relevant. I'll send it to them. Um, I'll like, if I'm on this podcast with you, I'll let my people know about, you know, your podcast. You should check out this great conversation I have with Sean. Like it's always nurturing every week, minimum popping into their inbox, staying top of mind and let, even if they don't open your emails, they see your name. Yeah. That Graham guy is really that's super helpful. That's super helpful. So you're not always selling. You're just adding value and nurturing most of the time. And then the fourth thing is, well, you built the course. You can build more products too. You know, like there's way more you can build. It could be a second course. It could be a membership community, like a paid community. It could be a, a group coaching program with 12 of your best students. You take them through and you're real close working with them. It could be one-on-one -on -one coaching. It could be a weekend retreat that you're hosting in your city. It could be, hey, I launched a book. You, you know, you should read my book. It could be anything. Um, you know, one of my, my, my buddies, Ramit Sethi, like he just launched a Netflix special, right? He's gone from like blogger to, he's on Netflix now. So he's going to use his email list to, hey guys, watch me on Netflix. That's technically a product. He's getting paid by Netflix to do a show, but he's using his list to let people know about it. So it could be anything, but that's the four things. It's content, email list building, nurturing the list and coming up with new products and building out a legit product suite because there's just so much more you can offer to a variety of different people at a variety of different price points. Wow. And if we take it back to recording revolution, how many products over the years have you had? Currently, there's three available publicly on the store. And today you've got all kinds of ways you serve people helping, especially like people in the Think Media podcast community 
packaging what they know into an online course. But back when you were doing that, but doing it for learning how to uh, learn recording, learn mixing, or build a home studio, how many products over the years did you create in that business? Yeah, probably like 20, you know? Wow. And did you retire some of them? I mean, uh, have some, maybe they were archived or updated? Yeah, or like some, some, of the some, yeah some kind of disappear, like they weren't that great. Some, like I had one little mixing course uh, called Rethink Mixing, and it was a $99 course, and it was not created in HD. It was, it was, it was not... I didn't think very technically great. It was just me like mixing a song in front of you and I just chopped it up. That thing has made me over a million dollars. Just this one little $99 course. It just kept selling for seven years. And I kept saying, I need to update it. It's, it looks so fuzzy and crappy. I can make it better. But it kept getting such amazing results for my students that I almost felt like there was something magical about it. I don't want to touch it. So I left it and let it run in my funnel for, uh, for I never had a big launch, never launched well but it made me over a million dollars over a seven year span, that one little course. And I eventually just cannibalized it and made Mixing University, which is just a whole a whole nother ball game. But I was like, I, I'm gonna let it run as long as I can. But yeah, so some things I phased out and replaced, some things I created collaborative courses. I mean, going back to what I was saying at the beginning when there was no music producers teaching the, the dark art of recording in the, in the mid 2000s, it's funny, come 2015, I, had, I, I would go to NAMM every year. I started to get to know a lot of producers. And they needed alternate forms of income. You know, the record labels were drying up. Streaming is really cannibalizing music sales. And so they have fewer clients to mix. These are, the, these are like my mixing heroes, like making the biggest records. And, and they started to have conversations with me like, hey, you got a big audience. Could we do a course together and split the money? I was like, yes, we could. So I made multiple products with multiple big name producers where we would film them teaching their thing and I would sell it to my audience and we would split it because I had the marketing machine, the leads and the trust and goodwill and they had a name that was famous and we, I created a ton of products that way and made them a lot of money and I made a lot of money and it was a lot of fun. And so, yeah, we've made a lot of different things over the years. And one other thing I will say is the platforms these days that you can use to sell your products, if they're courses like Kajabi, I'm a, I'm a Kajabi evangelist, so I'll keep saying Kajabi, but there's lots of options. What I love about these tools is you can have products, but then you can have offers that are separate, meaning you can get creative and say, look, it's Black Friday. I want to take my three most popular courses, bundle them together and call it something new. And I did that with like five of my best products. I called it the Radio Ready System. It wasn't a new product. It was a bundle of my five best products at 60% off with a shiny new thumbnail. And I just told them like, look, these are my five best products. It's a whole system. That thing started to sell so much better. I had a higher price point, but it was really just me repurposing and selling some different stuff in a different way. And it's just so easy to do that and get creative with your offers over the years um, with these kind of tools. So it's a lot of fun. In just a second, I want to learn what you feel like some of the habits, disciplines, and your kind of final thoughts about the traits of successful people that lean into this business model. But before we get there, I want to remind everyone a couple of things. Um, and that is that there's obviously a, t a thousand nuanced points to uh, learn about all of this. And so uh, definitely check out the show notes. Uh, Graham's YouTube channel, over 50,000 subscribers, uh, a lot of nuances about building your email list and writing copy and, and how do you host all this stuff. And so he's got a ton of free content there. And he also has a deep dive class that you can check out at thinkincome1k.com or we'll just link that up in the show notes. And so I highly recommend if you know you're ready to do this, and actually I recommend watching that regardless because it's always nice Every battle's won before it's even fought, reverse engineering and and thinking through, even if you're not ready to pull the trigger right now, thinking through, okay, where's this all going? And how am I setting this all up? And how am I positioning my YouTube channel, my content? And we we talk a lot about picking the right niche or the right topic because once that's that's huge. If certain topics are do not align as well with actually packaging things into a digital product later. So to your point, depending on what your aspirations are, it's good to think things through. And so um, definitely check that out. That free class that Graham um, has for you is at thinkincome1k.com. That just simplifies a link for you to get there. And you can check that out in the show notes. And then Graham, I have that final question for you in a second. But if people want to connect with you, where can they follow you online and everything like that? Yeah, the only social platform I spend time on is Instagram. So at the Graham Cochran, you can hang out with me there. 
or on YouTube, hit me up. Yes. And so uh, all of this will be summarized in the show notes. But Graham, I am curious, now that you've been able to serve particularly entrepreneurs, creators, you know, some terms that we love around here is contentpreneurs, there you YouTubepreneurs, go. and uh, infopreneurs is yeah. kind of one of the words of somebody who takes their knowledge or their information and turns it into a business. And uh, YouTube creators, entrepreneurs, small business owners, this would be our community but specifically for people that figure out how to thrive, like your pastor friend and student who is now got this thing down to 10 uh, to 12 hours a week, uh, able to uh, serve people, help pastors preach better, and also spend time with his family. He's created that freedom. People like him, what are some of the habits, disciplines, or traits that that are necessary for success or lasting success in this industry? I, I think the, the, the greatest greatest trait you can have in almost anything in life is is discipline to keep showing up. I mean, it's it's so overstated, but it's underused. I mean, people are looking for a shiny thing or, or something. It's, just, it's an excuse to not just do the thing that's in front of you. I've never known what I'm doing, right? I'm figuring it out as I go. I've always felt like if you hear the term imposter syndrome, I always feel like I don't belong here. Like I eventually someone's going to find out that I'm just Graham. I'm just the guy, you know? And when I started my business, like we were broke on food stamps. I had a baby and I'm, I'm in my spare bedroom making videos, writing blog posts, tweeting out, starting, figuring out how to host a website on WordPress in 2009 and the plugging in plugins and, and feeling like, Oh my gosh, I'm just Graham in the spare bedroom broken on food stamps. Like that's, that's how I felt while I was starting out. And, um, and so even though I've had some, some like success that makes me feel like maybe I, I know something, I thought the feeling would go away and it hasn't. And so there's this element of, well, I'm still going to show up anyway, and I'm not going to quit. Like I, I felt early on, and I think I developed this because I couldn't control much about our finances back then. I was so desperate to make money. I was like, I can't control anything other than I'm going to show up every day. I'm going to get in my office and I'm going to create something that's valuable for somebody and put out there in the world and hope it helps. And hope isn't really the best strategy, but it turned out that content creation that's valuable and showing up consistently was good. And so I was probably stubborn enough to stick with it, even though I probably could have quit multiple times. And I had a wife who supported me, which when I wanted to quit, so I I really thank her a lot. Um, So I think, yeah, the discipline to keep showing up Because so much of this business is, we've talked about is figuring it out, like figuring out your messaging, figuring out your take on things. When you get a little more confident on YouTube, you you realize, especially if you're in the education space, but I think it's true even if you're in the entertainment space on YouTube, getting more polarizing in a good way, like just putting a stake in the ground and saying, this is what I really believe. uh, And you can disagree with me and not having to be a jerk about it, but just being confident. People are attracted to that. That content does better. But that took me a while to be confident to sort of stick some stakes in the ground. So the discipline is huge. And then the big thing though, I see the biggest mistake I see some of these people making and my students too, eventually if they listen to me enough, they, they know like my philosophy and they either like it or they don't. But one of the biggest mistakes is just trying to make a lot of money. That's actually not that hard. If you stick in the game long enough, and like in YouTube, some of the stuff, you can figure out how to make money online. You know what's harder and more impressive is how to build a great life and build a business that takes care of your income needs, but you also have time to take your kids to school, pick them up, go to church, get enough sleep, you know, like go to the gym, wash your minivan, like whatever, like have time for friends. It, it's have a vacation and the business still run without you. That is more impressive and, and not hard, but it, it's more intentionality is needed. And so what I'm trying to teach students is don't think about, oh, I want to make six figures. Yeah. And six figures and I want to what work, how many hours do you want to work? How many days do you want to work? Have you ever thought about taking Fridays off and making it a family fun Friday or a date day with your wife? Or like, have you thought about some of these things? Because if you think about some of those things, there's tools and strategies to help you not just make money, but make them within these parameters of, you know what, I'm going to draw a line around my time, around my schedule, around the type of activities I'm willing to do. And you can still make a lot of money in these tight parameters. And I think a lot of people just have never stopped to think about it. And so they're just thinking about one goal, which is reaching my income goals without the lifestyle goals, and both can be achieved. Powerful insights. And man, it's so inspiring to talk to you because of really values alignment and the idea of having a a greater mission that's bigger than money. And then the idea of not giving up what you want most for what you want now. You know, I always 
I think I stole a quote from Larry Osborne, which was, if I gain the applause of the crowd, but I lose the love and respect of my children, I've failed. You know, if I make a lot of money, but I blow up my marriage, I've failed. And uh, of course, with deep empathy for our community, I know all kinds of stuff can happen in our life and in our marriages and our families and maybe sometimes lessons that we learn the hard way that can always help us reinvent and, uh, you know, press on into the future with greater wisdom. But you and I are both in all kinds of circles and we speak at events where we do get around people. We're in the green room with some people where it kind of could be scary. I, I hear some people say, you know, if you're, if your wife and kids aren't on board, who cares? You know, wow. it's like, we're yeah. going forward anyways. Like we're, uh, you got to just chase your dreams. You got to cut loose dead weight. And there is stuff of like about your circle and about different things. But I, I, at the same time, um, I think that ambition, a lot of people get messed up with this. People of faith, especially get messed with this. They think ambition is a bad thing. No, it's not that ambition is a bad thing, but toxic ambition is a bad thing. Oh, that's it's a whole that episode I'm, I'd love to have, man. Just that's near and dear to my heart for sure. Yeah. It's, a, it's a real thing. And it's, and actually you could be on either side of the spectrum where you could be on the side of the spectrum where some, some people need more. You're like, actually, it'd be really good for you to, to get some ambition yep. and maybe to capture some God given vision and have yep. a little bit of a drive. But for some people given to, uh, you know, get it. Letting, getting disconnected from their core values, ambition could lead you to the wrong place and potentially lead you away from the things that matter most. So I, I am so grateful for you and respect you, Graham, and grateful for all that you've shared there. Discipline to just keep showing up and then really thinking about what are your deepest values that you can actually align what it is you're building around. Graham, of course, we have all those resources that we highly recommend in the show notes. Graham Cochran, I wanna thank you for coming on the Think Media Podcast. 